today we are looking at uh, Judges chapter 10. And um, we're picking up, you know, once again with these judges. And we know that these guys are, that we see in here, uh, dealt with some very uh, <laughs> sad circumstances. And um, we're going to try to outline another guy. Good morning, Wayne. Good morning. And uh, we're on Judges chapter 10. And so the um, situation that we have now is we just got finished with uh, that little rascal Amalek. And, you know, if you remember, he was the guy that uh, was a son of, of um, uh, who am I thinking about him? Uh, Gideon. Gideon, thank you. Thank Gideon. you, sir. He was the son of Gideon. And, uh, you know, and he went and killed all his brothers and sisters except for one. And, uh, you know, went out and tried to make himself king after the people initially wanted to make Gideon king. So he thinking, well, if my dad don't want to be king, I'll be king. But just to make sure, I'm going to kill all my, all my brothers uh, and, and get rid of them as well. So he killed as many as he could. And so now we're picking up here in uh, Judges chapter 10, and we're going to see what happens after the death of Amalek. Um, and we'll see some, some things that are uh, pointed out here. They give very, um, they give little, little um, verbiage, like not a whole lot of words. But I think we can kind of unpack it and see what can we find in it. Uh, even though they don't say a whole lot about certain people in here, uh, we still can kind of find some things that we might be able to identify with. But uh, let's go ahead and get the reading in. Uh, let's take a listen here. Let me just turn the volume nice and up now. And we're going to take a listen to uh, Judges chapter 10. And the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Let me start at the beginning. Hide. Chapter 10. And after Abimelech there arose to defend Israel Tolak, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar, and he dwelt in Shamir in Mount Ephraim. And he judged Israel twenty and three years, and died, and was buried in Shamir. And after him arose Jair, a Gileadite, and judged Israel twenty and two years. And he had thirty sons that rode on thirty ass colts, and they had thirty cities, which are called Haboth Jair, unto this day, which are in the land of Gilead. And Jair died and was buried in Chemon. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and served Baalim, and Ashtaroth, and the gods of Syria, and the gods of Zidon, and the gods of Moab, and the gods of the children of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines, and forsook the Lord, and served not him. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines, and into the hands of the children of Ammon. And that year they vexed and oppressed the children of Israel. Eighteen years all the children of Israel that were on the other side Jordan in the land of the Amorites, which is in Gilead. Moreover, the children of Ammon passed over Jordan to fight also against Judah, and against Benjamin, and against the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was sore distressed. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, saying, we have sinned against thee, both because we have forsaken our God and also served Baalim. And the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Did not I deliver you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites, from the children of Ammon and from the Philistines, the Zidonians also, and the Amalekites and the Maonites did oppress you? And ye cried to me, and I delivered you out of their hand. Yet ye have forsaken me and served other gods. Wherefore I will deliver you no more. Go and cry unto the gods which ye have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. And the children of Israel said unto the Lord, We have sinned. Do thou unto us whatsoever seemeth good unto thee. Deliver us only, we pray thee, this day. And they put away the strange gods from among them, and served the Lord, and his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. Then the children of Ammon were gathered together, and encamped at Gilead. And the children of Israel assembled themselves together and encamped in Mispe. And the people and princes of Gilead said one to another, What man is he that will begin to fight against the children of Ammon? He shall be head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. All right. So, there we go. Chapter 10. And we see this transition here. And even though this chapter is not that long, there is a lot of things that have happen here. A lot of um, uh, things have transpired. And we're going to try to uh, point it out by just, you know, looking at 
uh, some of the very few words that are said about a few of these people and see if we can find out a little bit more about what may have been going on. Um, so let's start off. Once again, we're starting in uh, verse 1, and, and as you can see, like I always say, that when, it, when that chapter starts with and, there's some stuff that this particular chapter is building on. And so it's building on already what has happened with Amalek. And Amalek uh, uh, built on what was happening with uh, Gideon. And so we see here, it says, and uh, after Amalek, there arose a defender of Israel, Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo. Now, if, if anything is in a name, <laughs> you know, so Tola, that ain't too bad, but you got Pua, that sounds like somebody, you know, spitting something. And Dodo, well, you know, that just says for itself. All right, a man of Issachar. So here goes another tribe, a tribe of Issachar. They had their, their, their judge. And let's see what he did. And it says, and he dwelt in Shamar in the Mount in Mount Ephraim, and he judged Israel twenty three years, and died and was buried in Shamar. Now, that's Tola. That's, that's everything that's written about him. <laughs> There's nothing else to say here. Now, a lot of commentators will say, well, that means that this man didn't do anything. He just he you know he, nothing was uh, done by him that was worthy of recording in Scripture. And uh, they kind of, you know, write him off as probably, you know, a worthless judge. And I can see why somebody could come to that conclusion. But I would like to point out a couple of things about, uh, about Tola here before we uh, uh, just kind of write him off as somebody that did nothing and very uh, few things worth remembering. Um, let's look at one of the things that, that we can see here. It says that in verse 2, it says, he judged Israel 20 and 3 years. All right, so he was running the show, so to speak, being the judge in between God and the people for 23 years. Now, that doesn't mean you're doing nothing. You're doing something. If you're the mayor of a city for 23 years, you're doing something. If you're governor, if you're president for 23 years, you're doing something. Now, what we also can say, well, it don't say anything that he did. That's true. But it doesn't also say anything that he did bad. It doesn't say that he did evil in the Lord. It didn't say that he rebelled against God. It didn't say that he served other gods. It doesn't even say that he had, you know, a whole bunch of uh, wives and had, uh, you know, you know, thirty or forty or, or like or like uh, uh, Gideon, seventy uh, sons. So sometimes, not having anything wonderful said about you may not be all that great. But also keep in mind, nothing evil is said about him either. So I give my I give our, our, our friend Tola a, a pass on this. I, I, the Lord didn't put anything in here that would make me think that he did anything that was out of line. He certainly wasn't perfect, and he certainly wasn't great because he didn't do anything, you know, uh, um, great. But what he did do was judge Israel for twenty three years. I give him credit for that. I think it's worth it. And sometimes we can apply that to ourselves. You know, sometimes you're doing something and you say, "Well, you know, I'm I'm not really doing anything." Well. You've been on the job 23 years. You didn't become the CEO. You didn't create no new invention. You didn't become, you know, employee of the year or anything, but you were there. You put your time in. You did what you were supposed to do. The same thing I can say about uh, 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 raising children. You raise children. And, and then now, you know, going from being an infant to how many years? You know, 20 years. And you're still, you know, helping and assisting. You can say the same thing about being married. There's a lot of things that people do that are ordinary, but when you do it right, it's part of the foundation of what makes the world go around, so to speak. It, it keeps communities and, and cultures right. right. And so when you're doing something and you're doing it right and you're doing it consistently, um, that's something that is, I think, noteworthy. And God does note that. He does say that this man judged Israel for 23 years. And I think that's worth uh, uh, mentioning. And certainly uh, it's important to keep in mind. Uh, I, see, uh, uh, I see Calvin. Calvin, good to have you. And good, good morning, everyone. Good morning. And we're on, we're on Judges chapter 10. And we're just getting, okay. ready, getting ready to start the, the third verse. And so I, I give uh, Tola, uh, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, 
the credit for judging Israel for those many years. And I think we can also take that within ourselves. When you do something consistently, every day, year in, year out, I think God pays attention to that. You know, when you're serving the Lord and you're doing what God has called you to do and you're going through difficult things and, and, you, and you deal with it you, you know, week after week, month after month, year after year, it's noted by God. I think he understands that. Let's keep going. Let's see what happens after, after our good friend Tola. Look at verse 3. And after him arose Jair, um, a Gilead, and judged Israel for 22 years. All right, so here's somebody followed right after him, and he judged Israel, Israel <clears throat> for 22 years. Now, J now J.R., J J uh, if I'm saying that correctly, um, had more information that was said about him. Look at verse 4. And he had 30 sons and rode on 30 ass colts, and they had 30 cities, which are called uh, High uh, Voltjara. Unto this day, which are in the land of Gilead. All right? And then it says, And Jair died and was buried and came on. All right. So what do we see here? A little bit more information, but a same kind of situation. He judged Israel for 22 years. And once again, same, uh, I think credit should be given to him. However, it does mention a couple of things. Number one, um, it says he had 30 sons. So he was, you know, it doesn't tell us whether he had 30 sons by one woman. I would highly doubt it. <laughs> that was one woman that he had all these, these uh, sons with. Uh, and keep in mind that when it talks about them having 30 sons, that don't mean that that was the only, uh, that was the total number of children. It's just that a lot of times in the record that the, the the numbering of the female was not counted. They, they, sometimes when they cre created the records, they would keep the record of the sons and not the women. So he may have had even more children, um, more than likely. But we do know that it specifically says he had 30 sons. And he probably, and I'm doing this by just assumption, my own personal uh, uh, opinion on this, he probably had several wives, concubines, and things of that nature. We'll see that more in our next chapter when that becomes another issue. All right? But uh, dealing with our, with our friend here, uh, uh, J.R., um, he had 30, 30 sons, and, and, but then it also says, and they rode on 30 uh, ass colts, or, or 30 donkeys. All right? And they had 30 cities. So, what can we pull from this? Well, this was a man of, of, of pleasure and, and comfort. Well, why would you say that way? Well, number one, um, he had a, he probably had several wives. You know, and once again, I'm just pulling that because he has thirty sons. So you know, he's used to you know, hey, I, I you know, I get to pick and choose who I want to be with today. So from a a, uh, a emotional uh, uh, and 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 um, uh, you know, just dealing with the um, wanting to be embraced or, or comforted, uh, he had his pick. All right. He probably, in his 22 years, and following the 23 years of Tola, with those two uh, individuals, uh, uh, and both of them, not anything evil was said. But once again, we look at uh, uh, J.R., and we see here that it says that he, his son rode on 30 asses. They, ran, they had the 30 mules, these big these colts. And these were things that, that were prestige. You know, you didn't just ride on these mules and these donkeys. Um, because that was all you had. That was, you know, and if we were to bring it in our day today, it would be like, you know, he had 30 sons and they had 30 Cadillacs, you know, or 30 Lexus or 30 Mercedes Benz, you know. So, so he, you know, he's letting you know they lived well. All right. So that means that not only was he judging this, judging Israel, but he was profiting from this and he was passing the profit down to his children. Well, it didn't stop there. And then it says, and they had 30 cities. Now, let me make sure we understand this. It didn't say 30 houses. It didn't say, <laughs> you know, 30 uh, uh, apartment buildings. It said 30 cities. That means that they were prestige, wealthy landowners 
they were doing well. They were prospering. Right? Now, it doesn't say anything about them fighting or doing anything, but what they what they did do was they allowed prosperity to reign, at least in their house. It's possible that the that uh, it trickled down to Israel. So when we look at these two leaders here, we see that they were doing things that didn't break the system, but they also, when, especially when it got down to JR, it got to the point where they were really um, profiting and doing well by holding the office that they had of being a judge. Now, um, can we pull some good and bad out of that? We, we certainly can. We, can. we can say, well, why are you being so indulging, uh, uh, indulgent when um, you, know, you could be trying to you know, help those, you know, Jesus said, the poor you have with you, what, always. Uh, we could pull that out, but it doesn't say anything bad about it. It just said they were doing well. And I'm not a person that's going to begrudge anybody of, of prosperity if you're doing well. He built 30 cities, and it didn't say the cities were evil. It didn't say that the cities were, were serving false gods. It didn't say none of that. They just had, you know, good things. So I give him another pass, just like I gave Tola. I'm like, okay, he did okay. So you got 20, 23 followed by uh, uh, 22 good years. That's 45 good years, it looks like, with them doing well between these two judges. Okay? Now, I will admit that a lot of uh, commentators like beating these guys up. They didn't do nothing but, you know, they didn't do... Well, I mean, you can, and, you know, and I can understand why commentators would do that. But I'm not going to take that line. I'm going to say they didn't break anything. They kept it going. People were serving God. Okay? All right. Well, let's keep going then. Let's take a look. Verse verse 6. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam and Ashtoreth and the gods of Syria and the gods of Zidon and the gods of Moab, and the, and the gods of the children of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistine, and forsook the Lord, and served, uh, and served not him. Okay, wait a minute. What happened? When did this happen? Well, let's go back to verse 5. It says, And Jerod died and was buried. So, after, he, after these two guys lived, and they both died, then what happened? And the children of Israel did evil. So I give both of those guys a, a situation of, of, of a plus for their uh, reign as judges because you didn't hear that during their reigns. Their 45 years of reign, you didn't hear it. Now, the minute they both were gone, now all of a sudden, what happened? And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So both Tola and Jerah kept them folks in line. Y'all bet not serve any other gods. It doesn't say it here, but you can pull that from just the reading that we have. They had some kind of system going on where it's like, we're going to serve God. Don't be serving them other gods. Now, in the minute they both are gone, look at the gods they serve. All right. They go, they go out and they did evil. Why? Serving the gods of Baal and Asherah. And those were the fertility gods. And so that means they went back into all of these sexual religious aspects. And we're going to continually see, we'll get more and more into, you know, what it is that they're doing. But, uh, but just to say, there was a lot of uh, temple prostitution aspects to their worship. All right? And <laughs> that's a draw to any lustful man. <laughs> any, any man is like, oh, well, what kind of service you have? Well, we're going we're gonna to sit here and we're going to read this book. Well, what kind of service you have? Well, we're going to have you come in here and you're going to have your pick of all these wonderful, beautiful women. Well, you know what? I think I'm going to go to his service. That's what a lot of guys would say. Right? And so uh, it's sad that we see that because we as individuals, we will follow our lust. We will follow our... And so they serve the gods of Syria, the gods of, of, of Zidon, the gods of Moab. And we know Moab. It, it has a, 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 a tainted history of sexual uh, uh, deviance going all the way back. You can trace Moab all the way back to Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay? Uh, and the children of Ammon, the same thing. Am- Ammon traces all the way back to Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, and the gods of the Philistines, and forsook the Lord, and served not him. 
All right, so now they're, they're in a bad way. And they're in a, in a situation where they have rejected God and now have begun to serve other gods. And usually what it means when you're serving other gods, you're serving your own lust. You're serving your own um, uh, desires. You're feeding your own appetite. Not with the things of God, but the things that your base human nature wants. And a lot of times that's what happens. All right, look at verse 7. And it says, uh, And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. I tell you, <laughs> good morning, Mary. We're on um, uh, Judges chapter uh, 10, um, verse 7. Uh, it says, And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. Why? Because they have forsaken God. Now, keep this in mind. Some people say, Well, why does God always get angry with Israel when they leave and stop serving him. He lets, he, you know, the other nations, he seems to allow them to kind of go as they want, give them a choice. But when Israel, well, that's it's for two reasons. Number one, Israel, God didn't choose Israel. God birthed Israel. Israel is like uh, God's own child that it birthed because there was no nation of Israel. And then God told Abraham to leave his father. And from Abraham, God built the nation of Israel. They were just a clan and a tribe of, 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 of individuals until they got into Egypt. And in Egypt, they came out a great nation. All right. And so God is always going to have his jealous focus on Israel, just like you would have on your loved one. You go to, your, if your kid's playing a basketball game and you go to the game or a baseball game or a football game and you go there, you go in there to support your child. And you, you're focusing on what your kid is doing. What everybody else is doing, you want your, your kid's team to win and you want your kid to do well. Why? Because you're jealous of your, your child. You love your child with, an, with a uh, superior love that's above the love that you would have for the other people there. Not that you don't love them too, but you have that, that ultimate focus on your child. And that's what God has for Israel. Now, when your child keeps saying, I don't want to be your child, I want to be the child of somebody else. I want to be this. Right? So you have that kind of situation. The other thing that you have with Israel is that God also types them as being married to him. That's another thing. And it's the same scenario. All right. So when he, he, he brings them up as being one that he birthed, but he also brings them up as one that, that he has chosen to be his bride. All right? So then he allowed them to uh, come and to be part of what he is trying to, to develop and show and reveal to the, to the world through Israel. And they keep on rejecting him and going and serve other gods, which are not gods. They are false gods. And so God's anger is always kindled uh, against Israel because of those two things. All right? And I think that's something to keep in mind. Now, um, what did the Lord do? It says, and the Lord uh, was, um, was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines. So what he did was, okay, you're serving the gods of the Philistines? Let's let the Philistines then, and, and their gods, handle and, and manipulate you the way they want to. And into the hands of the children of Ammon. Same thing. Right? So God said, okay, fine. Go be with the one you want to be with. Go hang out with the one you want to hang with. Go on and do it. And let's see how they treat you. And, uh, and it says in verse 8, And that year they vexed and oppressed the children of Israel 18 years. All the children of Israel were on the other side of Jordan in the land of, of the Ammonites, which is in Galilee. All right. So we got to make sure we pull this out. So for 18 years, they oppressed all the children that were on the other side of Jordan. Now, do you remember when we were in the book of Joshua and even in, uh, even in uh, you know, some of the writings of Moses in Deuteronomy and, and, and uh, Leviticus and Numbers, that we had 
three tribes that wanted to stay on the uh, the wilderness side um, of the Jordan and not go into the land of milk and honey. All right. Now, uh, that, that always brought some issues. <laughs> we saw a couple of them already, and now we're going to see another one. They're easy prey. It's easy to get to them. Why? All right. Well, look what it says. Well, first of all, Ammon and, and, the, and the Philistines were oppressing the children of Israel for 18 years. All the children of Israel that were on the other side of Jordan in the, in the land of the Amorites. Well, that's where Ammon was there in that area, and they oppressed them. So they were the first ones to get hit. You know what? We're going to take advantage of you. All the goods that you have, we want to tax you. We want to get stuff from you. And the thing is, number one, first of all, you wasn't supposed to be on that side anyway. But you chose that because it looked good to the eye. You were walking by sight and not by faith. All right? And so you, 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 you're kind of living in the, in the area where the devil has strongholds anyway. Because you thought it was just going to be wonderful because of the fields and the land that was there. All right? So then we see here, look at verse 9. Moreover, the children of Ammon pressed over Jordan and fought against uh, Israel, so, I mean, uh, against Judah. So now they went over the Jordan River. Once they got rid of, you know, and remember those tribes were uh, the tribe of Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh that were on the wilderness side of Jordan. And so now when they're going over to the land of milk and honey, first thing they do, they go over to the Jordan and they fight against Judah. Wow, they hit Judah first. All right, we know that Judah eventually is going to become a powerful nation. And Benjamin, all right, keep your eye on Benjamin. Benjamin is going to be a problem in this, in this uh, book of, of Judges. They're going, they're going to almost wipe themselves out. Now, that's just a little foretaste of what we'll see going forward in the book of Judges. Right when we, Actually, when we get towards the end of the book of Judges, Benjamin is going to show his behind <laughs> like nobody else. All right? they, they're going to be really a bad tribe. But once again, and we'll see why, a lot of it has to do with lust. And we'll see that when we get to that. But that's just a little precursor. All right? And it says, and against the house of Ephraim. All right? So that Israel was sore distressed. So, so you got all these various tribes that now are being oppressed by the Philistines and by, and by Ammon. And once again, the concept of not being where you should be and adding on top of that, not serving God. Why do you turn your back on God? And God reminds them and told them. Look what he's going to say here. Now, let's keep reading. Verse 10. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, saying, We have sinned against thee, both because we have forsaken our God and also served Baal. All right. They're, they're finally now confessing and saying we have done wrong. But, it, I mean, 18 years? 18 years of saying, well, it's going to get better. It's going to get better. Oh, I'm going to keep on going. It's going to get better. Oh, yeah, we're going to do good next year. It ain't going to be so bad to follow. 18 years of that, lying to yourself. Folks do that all the time. Lie to themselves. Oh, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to get this, and it's going to be better. It's not if you're not going to serve God. You can try a whole lot of different things. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and, and I'm going to work on this next year, and I'm going get, to get, get, get my health together. I'm going to get my, my finances together. I'm going to get my education together. You know, I'm going to do all that. It's not going to work if you're not going to go to God. So they got 18 years of trying everything they could, and finally... They say, the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. Now you're going down the right road. And said unto him, we have sinned against thee, both because we have forsaken our God. We've forsaken you. So that's like, we didn't pay you any mind. We weren't uh, thanking you, giving you honor, being aware of your many blessings, being aware of your grace, being aware of your mercy, being aware of the little things that we take for granted. We weren't doing that. Plus, it says, and also serve Balaam. And whatever good we did see, we were crediting that to a false god. And so we see that in our world today. Everybody thinks, well, we're doing well because I'm a Republican or I'm a Democrat. 
or we're doing well because, you know, I invest in this particular stock. Or I, if God don't keep the city, the watchman watches in vain. And that's the thing we got to keep in mind. We got to put our trust and our confidence in God. All right? And allow God to deliver us. But look what God says in verse 11. And the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Do not I deliver you from, he said, Did not I deliver you from Egypt? I took you out of sin. And from the Amorites. All right? The Amorites, once again, that's Ammon. They, they, uh, 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 pull all of their heritage all the way back to Sodom and Gomorrah. I took you out of that, that out of that, that lustful mindset. I took you out of sin and helped to re reform your mind from the children of Ammon and from the and from the uh, Philistines and from uh, uh, the Zidonai and also uh, the Amalekites and the um, um, uh, Midianites did oppress you, and ye cried unto me, and I delivered you out of their hand. I've done all this before. In other words, what God is saying, we've been down this road many times. You know, you know, when you're a parent, how many times you got to tell your kids to behave? <laughs> it's like it's a never-ending situation. You're always telling them, stop, go down, sit down. Eat your food. Get up from there. Stop doing that. It's, it's a continuous development that has to happen. And God is pointing out, I've been bringing you guys through a lot of stuff. And you have made some progress. Look at all of the places you have gotten deliverance from. We can do the same thing. Make a list of all the stuff God has delivered you from. Number one, starting with bringing you out of sin. And then cleaning you up putting in you a new mind, allowing your mind to not to be conformed to, to, to this world, but being transformed. All, right? all of these things that God has done for us, and a lot of times we just still forsake him. And we begin to serve uh, other means and other, other ways. All right? And then he goes on, he said, uh, in verse 13, <clears throat> Yet ye have forsaken me, and served other gods. I've done all this for you, and you've turned around and said, I'm going to serve other gods. Why? Because these other gods uh, cater to your lust. They cater to your own fleshly appetite. And then you begin to serve them. And that speaks a lot about uh, how society is. You can have a society that can come up and say they want to be godly. But when prosperity comes in and when things start to do well, they're thinking, well, it's always going to be like that. And we're prosperous because we are so great or because we are so wonderful. We have to watch it in America. America keeps saying, well, we want to make America great again. America needs to be godly again. That's what America needs. And any nation that forsakes God is going to have a problem. And so this is what happening. This is what's happening to Israel. Uh, they're in the situation where now they've decided they're no longer going to serve God. But now, after seeing that and seeing their results, they now run back to God, crying unto Him. And God has to remind you, remind them, I've done this for you before. We've been down this road. Okay. Um, where we at? Verse. Uh, Let's read verse, first, verse 13 again, then we'll get to 14. Ye have forsaken me and have served other gods, wherefore I have delivered you no more. I've allowed them to come in for these 18 years and just, just uh, bind you up, turn you into a commodity, tax you to no end, oppress you. That's what sin does. 14. Go and cry unto the gods which ye have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. Wow. I take a lot from that statement. Because we do know that uh, this is a twofold statement here that you can pull this from. Number one, when you're in trouble and you go into gods that have no authority and no power, you're not going to get any victory. But then it also brings to me, into my mind, the, th the thought of, when the tribulation come, well, what will people run to for comfort, for help, for
for safety. They're going to run to the gods that they know. Their own military, those big old bunkers and things. You got a lot of people, they're trying to, you know, these so-called survivalists, they're building all these bunkers underground. Got, got, you know, two and three, four and five years of canned food stored up. And like, that's going to, that's going to save you. Once again, if God don't keep the city, the watchman watches in vain. So um, you run to these things, and people believe in these things. These people that, that spend, you know, these thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars building these bunkers, they believe these things are going to save them in tribulation. And it's not. We see that in the book of Revelation, it tells us that the mighty men, the kings and the princes, and, 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 and all of the, uh, the noble men, ran and hid themselves in the, in the dens and in the holes and in the caves and in the mountains and cried, saying, save us from the wrath of the, of, of the Lamb. All right, so they're going to do all of that in the actual uh, um, dispensation of tribulation, of the tribulation, and run to their, their false gods. And those false gods will not save them. All right. Uh, they're going to try a lot of things, but it's not going to work. You need to have God uh, as your God. You need to run to God, and you will find comfort and protection and safety there. All right, verse 15. And the children of Israel said unto the Lord, We have sinned. Now they're crying again. This is confession. Do thou unto us whatsoever seemeth good, Unto thee. Now, they're saying to God, well, Lord, if you see, if you see uh, fit to allow us to suffer more, and you see that that's the best thing for us, so we can learn more uh, through the suffering, then allow it to happen. When we're, we're going to allow you to do what you have to do. But, he said, uh, deliver us only. So let the trouble happen, but still deliver us from the oppressor. I'll take the, I'll take the trouble, but Get me out of the hand of the devil. Now that's a that's a thing. Sometimes you, you well, you know what? Yeah, I I I I've got some issues here, and I've done wrong, and all this kind of stuff. And I'm I'm going to deal with some consequences. I'll take the consequences. Just get me from just get me away from the devil. I don't want the devil to be my god anymore. I don't want to serve the devil. I don't want to serve Satan. I'll take the consequences. Do what you want to do, God. But I don't want to serve these false gods anymore. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. And so when they cried on to God like that, <clears throat> um, then um, they said, deliver us only. We pray thee this day. Look at verse 16. And they put away the strange gods. Now, you know, the Bible says, uh, it tells us in James that faith without works is what? Dead. So when they say we, we're not going to, you know, we're going to serve you and all that. All right, that's fine. But if you say that, but you're still going to the temple prostitutes, you ain't doing it right. So what did it say? They put away the strange gods. Now they're putting works to their words. You need works and your words. Your words have to be backed up by your works. They put away the strange gods from among them and served the Lord. And they began to serve God, even though God said, I'm not going to help you right now. This is fine. We're, we're, we're not going to serve the devil then. God, you may still bring uh, the consequences to me, but I'm still not going to serve the devil. I'm not going to serve these false gods. I'm going to serve you. Even though you will chastise me, and that's like a child. You know, when a child comes back, all right, sometimes you're like, well, you're going to be on punishment. Well, that's okay. I don't mind. I, I don't, I'll put me on punishment. I just want to be back in my house. I want to come back home. And so the Lord is letting them know. And so they're saying, we're going to serve God. So they put away the strange gods from among them and served the Lord. And his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. And it, it's basically saying, and God's grace and mercy was exhibited again. That's what that concept of, of uh, his, his soul was grieved. God looked upon them and once again, because he is a God, of mercy and a God of grace that came out of God because why? Why did that come out of God? Because that's part of what makes him who he is. And so he looked upon them and he saw them and uh, and he was grieved for the misery of Israel. 
We know that about Jesus. Jesus was on earth. Jesus didn't ha have uh, all parties, and he went to some. He, had, he went to the wedding. He went to various things. He had some good laughs, laughter times and fun, but he also cried. He also was brokenhearted. He also saw the misery. He also saw things that frustrated him to, to the point where he had to tell off the Pharisees. He went into the temple twice and had to overturn the tables because of the craziness that was going on in the house of God. And yet, yes, there are some times when the, Jesus' heart was in a, in a state of misery. And he, and he said, well, you know, he said, I would that you have known the day of your visitation. And so, yes, he has some sadness there. And so God has some sadness here, watching his own uh, uh, nation that he birthed going through the troubles and the, and the frustrations of dealing with the consequences of rejecting God. That's not fun. Verse 17. Then the children of Ammon were gathered together and encamped in Galilee. And the children of Israel assembled themselves together and encamped in Mizpah. Okay, what's going on? Well, Ammon done got word. These folks in Israel, they're not hanging out with us. They're not serving our gods. They're rebelling. They're getting ready to go back and serve that God that, that, uh, that Moses served, that Joshua served. So we're going to go in and we're going to fight them. We're going to, and, says, and they encamped. Now what that means is they basically surrounded them. I'm going to go around you and sit here and I'm going to wait. And encamping is like a siege. Well, I'm going to sit here and look for opportunities to either starve you out, look for a weakness, and then we're going to come in and we're going to uh, uh, take advantage of you when we see you are in your weakest stage. And so now they're sitting there um, and they gathered themselves together and encamped around uh, uh, Israel in Mizpah. So what is Israel doing? Let's look and see what happens. Look at our last verse here. It says, And the people and the princes of Galilee said one unto another, What man is he that will, that will begin to fight against the children of Ammon? He shall be head over all the inhabitants of Galilee. All right. So we know Galilee is a town within uh, Israel. Um, we know Jesus is also uh, uh, spent time in Galilee to the point where he was called the Galilean. So now these people are there, and they, they, they make this interesting statement, which, you know, to me, this, the answer to this is, you know, when it says, what man? Well, the man should be Jesus. So it says, and, and the people and the princes of Galilee said one to another, what man is he that will begin to fight against the children of Ammon? Who's going to fight the devil? Who's going to fight our enemy? Jesus. Right. But their concept here is they're still looking for a man. They're still looking for somebody. They're, they're trying to find somebody like Gideon, like, uh, Gideon. They need another mighty man of valor. Right? And so we'll see what happens. But once again, you need to find somebody that has the faith and the confidence and, and has the ability to be uh, 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 a leader that's empowered by God. See, the, the truth is that each individual should have trusted in God for themselves. But they refuse. They always want something that they can see. They refuse to walk by faith. They are determined to serve God by sight. And unfortunately, that is still a problem to this day. There are situations where people don't want to serve God if i got to serve Him by faith. And it's not always easy. We want to serve God by sight. I want to serve Him by sight. I want to be able to see the money uh, in the bank account. I want to be able to see the good uh, doctor's report that says I got, I'm in great health. I want to be able to see all of my... Uh, uh, children and all of my circumstances and my job working wonderful. I want to see all of that happening. And then I'm going to just trust God and I'm going to be the happy Christian and I'm going to walk around talking about, oh, it's so great to be a Christian. It's so great to serve God. All right, that's fine, but that's not how it works. You're going to have 
your difficulties. That is going to require faith. Well, you say, well, when, why? Why do I have to always have to have faith? Why can't I just walk on, why can't I be like the man that had the big barns? I, got, I can see my barns and they're full and I want to build even bigger barns. And that way I can see that I got substance. Well, God doesn't work that way. And Jesus said to that man, you're going to die. And who uh, are these items that you're putting into this barn? He's, it, 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 the concept of serving God by faith is something that cannot be understated, cannot be overstated, I should say. And the statement that, that is said in Scripture, without faith it is impossible to please God, is something we should take for, uh, uh, in, 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 in our, uh, our thinking. That God puts us in situations where we have to have faith in Him because he loves us. Because that's the real currency of service to God. It's your faith in him. Not what you can see. All right. the, the scripture that says you're going to be blessed because you have seen. But more blessed are those that believe and have not seen. Why? Because you have to walk by faith. You can't see it. So the concept of walking by faith is something that is consistently a struggle, not just for the children of Israel, but for us today too, for you and for me. We constantly struggle with this concept of I'm going to trust God though I don't see uh, a way out. I don't see how this is going to work. I don't see uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 the victory down the road. I don't see it. But you can know it by faith. Faith can be your evidence. It can be your substance. You can have faith as the thing that you can hold on to. But it's not faith in faith or faith in the substance or faith in the way. It's faith in God. Right? So when you have that, then you can have it. So when we're finishing up here, look what it says. <clears throat> 18 again. <clears throat> and the people at, and the princes of Galilee said one to another, what man is he that will begin to fight against the children of Ammon? Uh, and, and he said, uh, and he shall be head over all the inhabitants of Galilee. So he's basically saying, we want somebody that we can see, and we'll make him the ruler, the leader, and we will follow him. All right. But who are they supposed to be following? God. And they, they just don't seem to have, they don't have enough faith to follow God. They still need to walk by sight. And they don't get it that walking by faith is something. Now, the problem with walking by faith is you don't see the victory ahead of time. You don't see, you know, the, 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 the great chariots and the tanks and all the things that can guarantee you victory. You don't see that. You don't see the million dollars in the bank where you can go and buy what you need. You don't see all of that. But you do have it. God owns everything. The cattle on a thousand hills belong to God. So you, you, if you say, well, I wish I had, you do if you serve God because God has it all. That's why David said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. So he's walking in a place where, what does he see? A, va a valley, evil, shadows of death. But he says, that's what I see, but I'm still going what? I'm going to fear no evil. That's not always easy to do. People like quoting that scripture. You have to try to, li try to live it. Be in a problem. Get bankrupt. <laughs> have your bank account drop down to zero. And just be like, I'm, I'm, I'm in the valley of the shadow of death, but I'm going to fear no evil. No, we be, we're going to cry. <laughs> we're going to cry. We're going to be crying and, and looking to find out who we can sue. But the problem is we need to just go to God and stay there. He's got I an answer. I have something to say, Wayne. I'm on E now, but I just got the faith of God. <laughs> there you go. That's what you do. You got to have faith in God. And that is what's going to carry you through. Um, when you just don't have. And for whatever reason, God has chosen faith to be the currency for the spiritual growth of his people. That's what he has chosen. 
I can't explain it any deeper than that or any more than that. Um, so therefore, suffering, difficulty, pain, those are the things we see. But yet, while we're seeing those things, we still have faith in God. And that's what produces the strength, the growth. As, and you, sometimes we wonder, well, why does God's people have to suffer? They have to suffer because God is showing them that natural difficulties are no match for spiritual faith. And unfortunately, it's just hard for us sometimes to learn that lesson. Me included. I have to ask God all the time, help me to understand that, to lean on you when I don't see a way and not get worried and frustrated or angry or want to blame somebody. You know, you want to be able to do no, God's going to, God's going to handle this. I'm not going to worry about it. And so I, I, I generally, I said, well, you know what, God, I know you're going to take, take care of it, but then I have to literally say to myself, Wayne, don't worry. And then I, I said, okay, well, I'm not going to worry. But do you know what happens sometimes? I'm not worrying, but I also don't have the joy of the Lord either. I'm not, you know. So, but then can I believe God's going to handle it when I don't see the answer? Can I stop worrying? And can I have joy in the midst of the problem? Okay. So those are the things God's saying that, it, yes, you can do it if you believe on me. Now, if you got, if you still got all this trusting in your, in what you see, which we can be attached to, you're not going to be able to do that consistently all the time. Each time an issue comes up, you're going to have to have that same you know, battle. It's, it seems like the first few things is you, it's just to be comfortable with. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the hard part to sit back and like let it happen. You believe it's going to happen. You know it's gonna happen, mm -hmm. but to sit back waiting. Yeah. You know, to just say, you know, God, I know you got it. You're gonna handle it. So you know, let me just sit back and relax and don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. As soon as you sit back, you try to get relaxed. That's the first thing that comes to your mind. When is it gonna happen? Exactly. How mm -hmm. long is it gonna take? Exactly. Now, yep. I know it's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. Yep. You say to yourself, I can wait. But then you probably said it, did it happen? You know? <laughs> yeah. that, that, I'm saying that that's the hardest part. Mm -hmm. is just sit back and, and, and try to be relaxed mm -hmm. and just let it happen. Exactly. You know? You're absolutely right. Um, that's, the, that's the part when you just, you're in the, the problem, you're in the circumstances, and you're like, okay, God's going to work it out, but, uh, you know, how's he going to work it out? Let me, let me try to figure it out. And, you know, and you try to look and see and, and try to, and then the, the thing is, stop looking because you're not walking by faith anyway. Just go ahead and worship. And that's when the joy comes in. So stop trying to look and just start loving God. You know, stop trying to, you know, walk by, by sight and just worship by faith. And that's the lesson that I have to apply to myself. And I have to tell myself, just worship, Wayne. You don't see it, you don't know it, but you know God. And now just worship, just you know, lift God up, thank him for his goodness, and believe that he's going to go. And take one step at a time. I don't know what's going to happen next week, but what do I got to do right now? What step do I got to take today? All right, well, that's, I got to take this step. Well, that's not, that doesn't look like a step that's going to fix it. No, it may not fix it, but it is a step. It's like when you got to, if you had to walk from here to Florida, and you go, well, what, what's, what do I got to do? You got to take the first step. Well, if I take the first step, I'm not going to be in Florida by taking the first step. Yeah, but you'll never get there unless you do take the first step. See, so you got to take the first step. Well, what about, I don't took 12 steps now. I'm still not in Florida. Well, you're going to have to take, keep, take 12 more steps. And if you keep walking, you're going to eventually get there. It may take you quite a while. But the key is just keep taking one step and just keep going. And, and all of a sudden, you're like, okay, well, I'm not there. I'm still not there. And you don't realize you're just, you're just stepping. But now, wait a minute, you know what? You're you down in Georgia now. Yeah, but I ain't in Florida. Yeah, but you, you know, you, you're getting closer. And what's sad is why would you walk from New York all the way to Georgia and say, you know what? This is taking too long. I'm going to give up. 
Then you don't got that close. And that's what happens a lot of times. People go through all this stuff, all this stuff, all this stuff, and then they get real close. And you know what? I'm done with this. And they turn their back on God when they were that close to the victory. So the key is just keep going. As long as you don't quit, you will win. You just can't quit. See, if you quit, you know, it's the old saying, you know, win is never quit, and quit is never win. It's the same saying. You cannot quit on God. I'm going to trust God regardless. I'm going to keep going. Well, you've been, you've been walking this thing for three months. Well, I don't know how long it takes to walk to, to Florida, but I know one thing. It was done back in the Civil War. They did it. They walked from New York all the way down to, down to Florida. They walked from, they, they, people would, would, you know, get, get, get in there, those troops, and they would go from uh, the East Coast all the way down to Texas on foot. All right? So it can be done. But it's a matter of, are you going to quit after you've done it for a while and go, it's taking too long? Keep going. Keep serving God. Keep leaning on Him. Keep depending on Him. Keep trusting Him. Keep your faith in Him. All right? Because God will answer. And keep in mind that if you turn to God, where are you going to go? If you quit, where are you going then? Who are you going to go to? One of these gods here? The gods of, the, of, of, of Egypt and Philistine and, 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 and uh, 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 Ammon? And you're going to serve those gods? They don't have no victory for you. You might as well stay with the Lord. That's what the disciples said when Jesus told them, he said, are you going to leave also? And they said, to whom shall we go? You are the only one that have the words of eternal life. And that's an important wor uh, a word for us even on today. All right, we're going to stop here. Any other comments or questions on what we talked about today?